Hi, Jane with the Compassion Project. And I am here today with Marnie Van Wyk. Say hi. Hi, Jane. <laughs> and I'm really, honestly, I'm just honored to have you here, Marnie. You're an amazing person. And so I'm gonna tell you a little bit, bit about this incredible woman. So she is from Plainfield, Illinois. She is an incredibly kind, compassionate woman with a heart of service. And she is truly making a difference in this world. As a former teacher of over 15 years, Marnie has a passion for education. Combine that with her love for international missions and you will understand why in 2010, she got involved with New Life for Haiti. After traveling to Haiti for a child sponsorship trip, Marnie was struck by the warmth and hospitality of the Haitian people. But she realized underneath Haiti's beauty and resilience was desperation to find a way out of poverty and hopelessness. So in 2015, Marnie joined the board of directors as trustee, which led to New Life for Haiti's School of Hope. She eventually uh, stepped down from the board and her teaching career to lead New Life for Haiti as the executive director. That's incredible, Marnie. So on a personal note, Marnie has been married for almost 27 years to her college sweetheart, Michael, and they have three grown children. Riley's 24, Noah is 20, and Lily is 17. So they are a very close-knit family. They love to travel and camp and boat in the summer. Um, but this global pandemic has put um, <laughs> their keen sense of wanderlust to a test because all of us are really going through a lot right now. So welcome, Marnie. I'm excited you're here. And I'd love to start <laughs> with how you are coping uh, as a family and personally during this time of pandemic and social distancing. Well, so how are you doing? We're doing okay. Um, and thanks for having me, by the way. I, I really appreciate it. Um, you know, I think like for everyone, this was, it, it just happened so quickly, you know? And so um, I think everybody feels this. We were sort of forced to learn how to cope quickly. And, and um, you know, that's been a process yeah the last few months i think um you know we had part of our we have two grown kids that live out of the house and so they were actually back with us for a few weeks so all five of us were back in the house together after seven years um, oh wow so, yeah so um you know that involves some negotiations and some i don't know you know just a lot of communication i think um yeah. and everybody's expectations for that time but it ended up to really be a great time together and um our two adult kids have still uh, have since gone back to their respective states and it's just my husband and daughter and i now but you know i think the biggest thing we've learned to do is we've learned to not be busy and that is a big change for our family we've learned to slow down and just kind of um, appreciate the smaller things and the things in our, I say, it's in our own backyard or, in, you know, in your own house and in your own family. Um, yeah. And learn to try to see this time as a blessing instead of a curse. Exactly. I think a lot of us have realized that we, like, we've all had to slow down and it, it is a blessing, but it's that, I think it's that change when you go from busy, 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 and the way your life was. So all of a sudden it's like, what now? <laughs> Right. It's, it really is a shock. And, and I think the one that struggled the most is our daughter because she's, you know, just finished her junior year of high school and, um, you know, just busy with job and sports and school and, and friends and work and went from, you know, being away from the house, probably, you know, 12 to 14 or 16 hours a day to being at home 24 hours a day. So that, I mean, that's wow. it's the biggest adjustment for her. So she's 17, Lily? Yes. 17. So was she, is this for you that she graduated? No, fortunately, oh. she just finished her junior year and she'll be starting her senior year. Oh, okay. So, cause I feel for all the, all the kids that missed their graduation. I know, I know. And I have a lot of former students that were, are in the grad, actually the first year I started teaching at, at one of the schools I taught at, um, 
this that class is graduating this year and so i have a lot of former students who are going through that right now and my heart goes out to them and their families wow it's crazy so i'm really excited to talk about um what you do with new life for haiti so i know um, you gave up your teaching career how long did you were you a teacher for I was a teacher on and off for about 20 years. I took a few years off in the middle to stay home when my kids were young. So I taught and then I stayed home for a while and then I went back to teaching for eight years before I stepped down or, you know, stepped away from that into New Life for Haiti. Oh, wow. So now, and growing up for you, was you were, were your parents involved as missionaries in any way? Like, is that something that you grew up in? No, to? no. Um, it's something that my husband and I got involved in when we were early married, when our, our oldest was just a couple years old, we uh, took our first mission trip to Russia for two oh. weeks. And that's kind of what gave me the the bug for international missions. Oh, really? Okay, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. So, um, so what, like, what was in you to get part of New Life for Haiti? So was that, a, it was a child sponsorship trip, trip you went on? And yeah, so New Life for Haiti was actually founded out of the church that my husband and I um, were going to at the time and are still a part of after 25 years or so. Um, it was founded by the, the lead pastor at that church. And since then, the, the New Life for Haiti is separated as a separate 501c3 from the church. Um, the church is still one of our partners, but we're, you know. What is the name of the church? I'm sorry. The name of the church is Life Spring Church in Plainfield, Illinois. Okay. So Pastor Fran Lehman is, is the one that founded New Life for Haiti. And um, that's how I got involved because I was teaching at the time and they were having this trip, this child sponsorship trip. So we have a child sponsorship program. We have about 300 kids in the program. And every year we go down and we take updated photos of the kids and we bring some new kids into the program. And so that trip just appealed to me. I like photography. I like photography. I love kids. So I thought, well, this would be a good way to get my feet wet with this organization and with going to Haiti on my first Haitian missions trip. And so that was, like you said, in 2010. Wow. So what, when you were there, what was it that you felt when you were there? Because that ch trip changed your life. It did. It really did. <laughs> it changed the whole trajectory of my life. You yeah. know, I I think um, it's hard to summarize or put into words sometimes, but I think really it's the openness that my heart felt when I was there. Um, you know, it, there's a simplicity to life when you're in Haiti. And um, it feels like everything, to me at least, it feels like everything slows down and you're much more aware of what's really important in life. And spiritually for me, I just felt like I could hear so much better. I could hear, um, you know, my connection with God was stronger and I could hear from him better. And um, in addition to that, you know, the Haitian people are just the most um, kind, caring, um, loving, open-hearted, and, and amazingly positive people. Um, and I, and I loved, you know, just being around them and, and being able to develop friendships with them has been uh, a huge blessing in my life. Wow. Because you know what? It's interesting because sometimes we think we have, you know, it's so great here in North America, you know, Canada, the United States, we have so much, but it's almost like we have too much. We're too busy. We, have, we put happiness into material things and we just have so much stuff and then and and i think all of us are searching searching for that joy peace and then you here you go to haiti where they don't have as much and it's like you say you you could hear your god um clearly because it's like to slow down and your heart opens and your and your mind isn't lost that you actually can connect easier i guess hey yeah, I'm glad you said that. Um, I think it's that ability to be free from distraction, from all of the distraction of your schedule and your busy life and, you know, all the things that we're always running around doing. And and so part of that is just getting away from home, you know, I think and from, from your normal routine. But the other yeah. part of that is just the simplicity of life. You know, um, people, a lot of people in Haiti, especially the area where we work, which is a very rural, remote area of Haiti. Um, What's it called? It, it's 
the the town is called Marfranc. Haiti has 10 uh, kind of provinces. They're kind of like states. And so the one that we work in is called Grand Anse, and it's at the western end of the southern peninsula of Haiti. And okay. so it's, it's about as far, it's almost as far from the capital city of Port-au-Prince as you can get. And um, so it's very quiet. It's, um, it's just a, you know, rural, simple, the way of life is very simplistic. And so I, you know, when I, when I step off the, the little plane that we have to take to get out to where we work, I kind of take a, you know, a deep breath and you kind of just feel immediately life just slow down. It's sort of, I guess, what you would imagine going from the city to the country might be for people who, who like the country. Um, it's yeah. that same feeling where life just kind of slows down and becomes a little bit more simple. And I think it really clears some of the distraction from your mind and allows you to think and hear um, and just really be present to people and be present in the situations that you're in. Wow, that's amazing. So that trip when you went in 2010, did, did you, is it when you got home, you decided to get involved? Um, yeah, I would say when I got home, I'm a, I'm a person who takes a while to process things. So when I was there, I was busy just kind of taking it all in and not really processing. And when I got home about a week later, I started to really process things and think I could see myself involved with this you know, at a deeper level and for a long time. Wow, that's incredible. Well, you and I actually connected or I, I found you through Neil Scorey, who's he's working with New Life as a pastor. I talked to him um, Friday. He, um, yeah, because he's been working with New Life for Haiti for 10 years, I think he said. Mm -hmm. Goes yeah, every so November on a... Yeah, so Neil um, helps with our medical missions uh, kind of division. And we do these one, uh, once a year medical clinics and he's been leading those for, I think, the last six to eight years or so. Wow, that's amazing. So, okay, so let's talk about what's happening in Haiti with this COVID-19. I, like, I have to admit, I I feel like, I don't know, sometimes I, I feel like, you know, we, we get caught up in our own life and our own things are going, going on with us, um, which is normal. But there's so much going on in the world and some people are affected at such high levels that just breaks my heart. And until I heard you, I thought I never thought about what was happening like in a place like Haiti with COVID-19. And that's why yeah. I wanted to get you on here because I think people need to be aware of what is actually happening. Yeah, you know, and I think that's really understandable. People are, are dealing with all sorts of hardships right now. You know, there's job loss and there's illness and now we have, you know, riots and, and it's, you know, there's a lot of craziness going on in the world. Yeah. And so um, I think it's human nature to focus on yourself and your people first. Um, and, you know, and then after you kind of feel like things are more stable to kind of look out beyond yourself and that's just human nature. But, um, you know, Haiti is kind of behind the U.S. with the COVID-19 thing because it just took a little bit longer to get there, um, you know, and and of course, there's all sorts of different theories about the degree to which the virus has spread in Haiti. Um, you know, it's, it's a lot like people were saying when the virus first started spreading in the U.S., you know, people are speculating about that the numbers don't really show the true picture and there's a lot of talk this week in particular about a lot of people with fevers and body aches and that type of thing but um you know haiti is the only third world country in the western hemisphere and um the so you can imagine the lack of access to medical care there um for the average person and there are some wonderful not-for-profits working in haiti um, in the medical field, um, but it's very limited. And um, their testing ability is very, very limited. And so um, the virus for a while, for, for I would say for several weeks, even maybe a couple of months, we weren't hearing about any cases out in the Grand Anse department where we work. But um, in the last week or two, I think there's been about 20 diagnosed cases. And, you know, I, I had heard all sorts of numbers in the beginning when the U.S., you know, was encountering this, you know, and, and I think that the speculation is probably similar in Haiti, that it's probably 10 times the, the number of diagnosed cases. So, you know, we're definitely beginning to see it spread in the area that we work. 
Yeah. And, um, you know, there is just very, very little access to medical care there. That's crazy because I, I thought I, I had watched uh, one of the lives you had done and you said something about there's eight to 10 million people in Haiti and there's mm -hmm. approximately a hundred to a thousand testing kits. That's it. I was mm -hmm. like, I, I just thought, oh my goodness. And then, yeah, I just thought, it's and that, you know, that number may have increased since then. Yeah. Um, but, but still, you know, the, the ratio of test kits available to the number of people is just extremely small. And then what about getting, um, like flights obviously aren't going in there now, or are they? Are there flights for cargo going in or bringing supplies to them? I think there are limited um, flights going in for cargo. There are no passenger planes going in at all. And there are just a few coming out. And um, those are very limited as I understand it. So, um, and, and, and that's actually, you know, probably the best way to protect Haiti right now. Um, you know, in terms of the virus, of course, that's limiting yeah. the um, humanitarian relief and personnel that can come in from all of these not-for-profit organizations that are usually working in Haiti as well. So that's limiting all of us and our ability to to be there on the ground. So that's difficult. Yeah. So how has it? Yeah. How for you has it changed being able to help them? Like what? Because. Obviously, the, any trips you had planned to go there are canceled, or how do you help on a more, I don't know, how are you doing it? <laughs> well, you know, I was um, really blessed. I was able to get to Haiti in late February. Oh, I came okay. back from Haiti February 26th. Oh. And so um, we, I was really glad. I took a, a small team there. We Part of the team put a roof on. Um, the boys' home at the orphanage that we run, the Village of Hope Orphanage. And the other part of the team um, took some new kids into our child sponsorship program. And so we were fortunate to be there at the end of February. So that was great. I was able to meet with all of our staff and, um, you know, just kind of assess things. We're, we're in the middle of doing a lot of research right now for a possible medical clinic in one of the communities in which we work. So I was able to do the research for that while I was there. So fortunately we were able to accomplish a lot of things on that trip in February, but of course we haven't been able to be back since then. Right. So, um, you know, uh, we have a Haitian field director who's phenomenal. His name is Velix Plazier and hi to you Velix if you're watching. Um, Velix and I meet about once a week through video calls. We text, we talk. Um, you know, of course, it, I think it's just like any other business that's running right now, any other not-for-profits communication is so important. And yeah. we're relying on technology just like everybody else is right now. And, um, you know, I think the silver lining has been that we've been able to communicate probably more than we did in the past. Because, you know, if I knew I was going down there in a couple of weeks, I'd just put it on a list, you know, of things to right. talk about it, you know. But now, you know, we're, we're talking more frequently and we're handling things probably more promptly than we have in the past. So I think that's been the silver lining. Oh, that's good. So, and do you, how, how can people help? Like, I know, are you doing, you're doing some fundraisers we during are. this? So tell yeah, us about them. Go ahead. Oh, I said, tell us about these fundraisers. I want to hear about those, how we can help. Right. Right now, we're doing uh, all of our fundraising is based on responding to the COVID-19 relief, our, our relief efforts. And um, the easiest way is to text the word COVID aid, C-O-V-I-D-A-I-D -I to 71777. And um, that's an easy way to donate. We are um, we're doing all sorts of things to help with the COVID-19 relief. Um, in the beginning, we were doing a lot of prevention education. So we had, were printing up flyers, we uh, bought megaphone systems and we're making uh, public service announcements all over town, but especially up in the mountain communities where we work, they, a lot of people up there don't have cell phones or radios. And so some of them weren't even aware that this was going on. So we were up there in the mountains making those announcements um, since then, we've purchased soap and bucket units. Uh, most of the people in the area where we work don't have running water in their homes. And so just the simple thing that to protect themselves, like washing your hands, 
is challenging. And so we yeah. put these open bucket units all around in the, the hundred of them in the different communities um, and areas that we work. Um, this next week, we will be um, uh, working with local seamstresses in uh, one of the communities. They are sewing masks that we're we're going to buy from them to kind of hope, hopefully pump some money into the local economy and then give those masks out to free for free um, in the area that we work. Oh, that's um, good. Yeah, yeah. And uh, we've been doing a lot of food relief also. Um, the, the price of food, unfortunately, Haiti has been going through a lot of um, challenges prior to the COVID-19 uh, crisis with politi with the political climate. And so um, that's affecting the economy, which has caused food prices to really skyrocket. And so the average family is just really struggling just to feed their kids. And so, for instance, this past Saturday, we brought our teachers in who aren't working right now because schools are closed there, just like they are here. And they were gracious enough to pack uh, meal packs for families. And we distributed over 200 meal packs for families in the area where we work. So well, that's you know, we, good. yeah, we've been doing a ton of, um, of COVID aid relief right now. And I think that you, there's a video on the new life for Haiti.org. Was there a video on that? Yes. I saw. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. That's amazing. Yeah. So we'll, I will put in the comments that, um, what you said, COVID aid and what, what is it you text to that? 71777 COVID aid, C O V I D A I D. In 71777? Yes. Okay, we'll put that in the comments. But the other thing that I had, I heard you talk about, which I thought was interesting, just something I haven't thought about in Haiti. Like you said that they um, have weekly markets that are really important. So they need to go to those markets to sell their goods so that they can then buy food and feed their families. But it's almost impossible for them to social distance or do they understand the so you know I, I thought that was interesting i never thought of that yeah it's it's a real challenge and that's why getting these masks out is so important so there's a weekly market in every community and it's on different days of the week in the community where our uh, headquarters is it's on wednesdays and so people come from all over uh in the mountain communities up, you know, up above where we work um, and in other communities. And they, they do a couple of things, you know, first they bring things that they've made or they've grown to sell, and then they'll use that money to purchase food or other items that their family needs. And uh, there are just, just a few stores in the area where we work. And there's kind of like small, um, some of them are open air, just a small stand. Some of them are just a small, you know, storefront, uh, very small places. And so most people rely on these weekly markets and they're crowded. I bet. Um, so, and, you know, a lot of people just don't have a choice. And so, you know, one of the other things we've done is for some of the most vulnerable populations, we've given them credit at these stores so that they can go into a store rather than having to go to the weekly market. Um, because you really just can't keep people away. You know, that's like saying you, you have no way of, of, of earning any kind of living and you will not be able to have any money to buy the food that your family needs. And so, you know, it's, it's definitely, social distancing is definitely a huge challenge. Wow. That's, yeah, I can't imagine. I mean, here it's even it's even a challenge here because they put all they put those six feet apart, and you know people are supposed to wear masks, and they have all these rules. But people still, you know, people just want to get together. Yeah. Yeah. It's I couldn't hard imagine to keep people apart, especially for you know for this long. Yeah. Um, yeah, so, you know, I, I am, the good news is I am seeing more and more people in that community as I see the photos and the videos come from our field director. I am seeing more and more people with masks. And, you know, the day we did our food distribution, we, we tried as hard as we could to say, you know, you really need to have a mask when you come. But, you know, sometimes people are faced with the choice of, you know, I don't have a mask and I need to feed my family. Um, yeah. And, 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 you know, this is not just, I need, I don't have very many groceries. This is, I have no food. And yeah. So, they, I mean, what can you do? They have to feed their family. You got children. There's no, right. Yeah. Right. right. So, um, 
Yeah. So is there anything else you want to add at all? Is there any other way that people can help? I know there, are you still selling t-shirts? We are not selling the t-shirts anymore, but I do have another good idea. Okay. <laughs> we, we have a wonderful child sponsorship program, Jane, and um, we, we have a, a child, a school sponsorship program and an orphan sponsorship program. And right now we have one of our little orphans, Saskia. She's a sweet little six-year-old girl. She is waiting for a sponsor. And we have about 36 kids in our school sponsorship program who are waiting for sponsors and Aww. you can yeah if people go to our uh, website www.newlifeforhaiti.org and they click on the at the ribbon at the top that says sponsor a child it's um you know it'll take you right to that page where you can see um all the kids that are awaiting sponsorship and um you know our sponsorship program is wonderful it provides tuition and uh, books, uniforms, shoes, all the school supplies that kids need, vitamins. It provides uh, meals at school and also uh, access to emergency medical care. If there's ever oh, any wow. emergency for a child involved in our sponsorship program. Um, okay. So if, should, go ahead. I was going to say, just put the website up there, newlifeforhaiti.org. I'll put it in the comments too so people can actually click on it. And you said there, it's at the top of the page, it shows the children? No, there's a button that says sponsor a child at the top. Okay. Of the page. And how much is it monthly to sponsor a child? It's $34 a month to sponsor a child. And you can write letters back and forth with your sponsored child, and you can even send them little gifts if you'd like. And, you know, when we do start getting back to Haiti, we, when we're able to bring teams again, we invite people to come to Haiti with us and actually meet your child. This is the child sponsor. And a lot of people, I would say, you know, probably 100 people have come with us to Haiti to meet the kids that they sponsor. And it's just an incredible trip. That's amazing. So how many children are waiting for sponsors? 36? 36 in our school sponsorship program and one in our orphan sponsorship program. Oh, wow. Okay, and what's her name? What's the little girl's name? The six year old, did you say? Saskia is her name. Saskia? Mm-hmm. Aw, okay, that, that's amazing. Um, yeah, <laughs> I'm like, I wanna get on and... Well, you go ahead and do that, Jane. <laughs> I'm just gonna encourage you right now to do that. <laughs> we would love that. I am, I am, oh my God. Excited. Okay, so yeah, is there anything else you want to add or let people know about what's happening? Or you know, um, I just wanted to say that um, New Life for Haiti has a lot of other programs we haven't talked about today. We have a um, a goat breeding project that um, is like a pay it forward program where a family is given a goat and then it can, a female goat and it can breed with our male goat. And um, I did not, I've learned a lot about goat breeding since we got, uh, since we started this project, but when goats have babies, they have either one or two kids. Um, and so if uh, they have two, then they give one back to the program and that's given to another family. Oh, and, wow. Uh, yeah, it's a really neat program. We we also do uh, teacher training, um, and I, that's something I'm really involved in. And, uh, you know, we built seven schools in that area, and our uh, one of our most recent schools was the uh, School of Hope that you referred to in the beginning. Um, it's a model, serves as a model for all the other schools in the area, and um, it's run quite differently. It has uh, small class sizes and um, has a lot of great resources for the teachers. You know, one of, the, one of the things I learned when I got involved with New Life for Haiti as a teacher is that the um, education system, especially in the rural areas, it, um, is really struggling. The, the uh, class sizes are just amazingly large. Some of them are up to 60 kids in one classroom. Oh, and, wow. Yeah, and these poor teachers really lack any kind of resources. The school that I observed at had a teacher and a chalkboard. He had a piece of chalk, and the kids were sitting on wooden benches in, you know, 95-degree classrooms, 60 kids in a classroom. And, um, you know, most of the 
methods for teaching that they use are um, recitation and, you know, kind of like what you would imagine maybe school to be like in the 1940s or the 1950s, where a student stands up and has to recite something and then sits back down, very formal. And, you know, um, it's just not a great way for kids to learn. And so when we opened the School of Hope, we opened it with a very different model. The uh, classrooms are limited to 25 kids per classroom, and there's a teacher and an assistant in every classroom. They have all sorts of learning resources, um, just a very different methodology. It's, it's, and it's um, something we do every summer, you know, if we're able to get down to Haiti, which we're, we're praying we will be able to. But, um, you know, we do these trainings with Haitian teachers to um, teach them really strong methodology where the kids are interacting with each other. It's a much more um, active learning style. And uh, like I said, the class sizes are smaller and they have all sorts of resources. So um, since, since we opened the model school, we opened a second school based on that same model called the Village of Hope School. And that is on our orphanage campus. And that's our school for our 23 orphans. So, that's amazing. Um, yeah, thank you. When did that last school open? Um, well, the model school opened in um, uh, September of 2016 and the Village of Hope School opened in Let's see, it would have been September of 2018. Wow, you're doing incredible. That's that's amazing. Thank you, thank you. Wow. So are there any other organizations? You said there's that, how do you, is the goat one? People can sponsor a goat? <laughs> no, they can't really sponsor. Not sponsor, a goat. not sponsor, but donate or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> that would be just a general donation. We do have a donate um, button at the top in the ribbon that I that I referred to on our website. So that would just be a general donation. But people can, um, you know, put in the notes on our donation donation page if they would like to donate specifically to that program. Oh, I see. Okay, so, I was like, I'll sponsor a goat. <laughs> <laughs> Give goats to families. Oh my goodness. Okay, amazing. Honestly, the work you're doing is incredible. Um, yeah, you're a blessing to this world. And yeah, you are truly making a difference and I admire you. So any websites that um, you have, we'll just put in the comments so people can look at them and hopefully we can help out in some way and especially with sponsoring the children, right? Okay, well, thank you so much, Marnie. I guess we should sign off. I probably could talk to you for a lot longer, but. Okay. Well, thank you so much for having me, Jane. And I, you know, I just wish you and your family the best during these times. Stay safe and healthy. Thank you. You too. God bless you. Thank you. You too. Okay. Bye. Bye-bye.